much sort of focus on the textile side. Um, I'm going to be presenting a talk today, which is going to go through a few different things, uh, a little bit about the SCA, a little bit with some of the work I'm doing with some Coast Salish weavers outside of the SCA, um, and then a lot about um, foraging um, and and really it's about it's about what color is out there and and how you can incorporate that um, into into what you like to do. So the talk's called Lessons from the Forest, Natural Dying with Mushrooms, Lichens, and Plants. Um, I'm going to start by saying good evening, and I'd like to acknowledge that I am broadcasting from the shared unceded territory of the Musqueam First Nations. So my passion is trying to understand and recreate ancient textiles. Um, in the SCA and for most, most of my adult life, I've focused I'm just gonna, I'll answer some of the questions as they pop up. Um, one of the questions is Coast Salish as in First Nations people. Y yeah, and I'll, I'll cover that, I'll cover that towards the end. Um, so in pre-Christian Europe, in the SCA, I focus on Viking Age, Anglo-Saxon and late period Roman, sort of in the G Germanic area. Um, I like looking at ancient animal breeds and how fiber was processed, spun, dyed and woven. Um, at this stage, I've also studied and learned from people all over the world. My husband and I had the opportunity to live in South Africa for about four years, um, which is Drakenwald. And we ended up doing a rain and um, got, getting to sort of travel around there and, and uh, interact with a lot of other people and the artists over there. Um, and then when I'm not in the SCA, I'm an ecologist. So basically I, I focus for a job on sort of the assemblages within the forest, what fits together, and then how do we help manage those. Uh, for up here, we call them species at risk in Canada. You guys call them um, endangered species, but it's the same thing. So I did a lot of work on frogs and birds and that kind of stuff. And this is me and my husband, all, Duke Alf, or Alfer. Um, some people know him, and these are our three kids. And we live here on the uh, Musqueam Reserve, though we're settler descent, I'm settler descent. So uh, what does that look like, like recreating ancient textiles? So there's a piece here. Um, if you look at the picture, you can see some um, coils, some metal coils. So that's sort of um, Finnish Iron Age, which is a, a culture at the same time as the Vikings, but just a, you know, a, a culture over um, and all around uh, sort of Latvia. Um, and so if I'm looking at wanting to recreate something, first I start with what's the right sheep breed. So these sheep here, these are an ancient breed. These are Gotlandic sheep where both the male and female sheep have um, horns still. And they have other aspects of them that make them an ancient breed. They're also quite a bit smaller. Um, so I look at the fiber to start. And then I process them using the tools that they would have had at the time. These are Viking combs. Then I spin them up, it gets dyed. Um, and then we get weaving. So this loom is called a warp weighted loom. Um, it's got, you can see at the bottom, it's weighted at the bottom and then you move those bars to give you your pattern. Um, and then here we are, this is, you, I'm sure you all know Kalja. So Kalja came up here and we did a demonstration at the at local museum when they did a, a Viking show. We were actually demonstrating how to warp up and then use the warp weighted loom. And so this is one of the finished products. And so this is, these are two outfits. This is finished Iron Age that my husband and I stepped down in when we did a rain here in Ontier. Um, and one of the great things about the SCA that I love is, is collaborative projects. So a whole bunch of people worked on different aspects of this outfit. And then um, the red, for example, that was dyed with matter and the green was dyed and the gloves. And so all, there's certain different aspects of the outfit that were, that, were, um, that were naturally dyed. As we know, Hollywood usually depicts ancient people as being in all browns and golds and tans and beige. If you do a Google image search for Vikings, those are the colors that come up. But as we know, in the SCA, people, ancient people had a lot of different colors. Um, there's a lot more going on uh, than Hollywood tells you, as I'm sure most of you know. And so for many years, uh, because I came in from the SCA, I wanted to use what were period dyes, which were all European-based dyes. So I, here we've got a shop in Vancouver, BC called Maiwa, which is a great shop. Um, and it sells dyes by the bin. And so I would get in my car and I would drive down to the store and I would buy dyes that were, that were period but I kind of realized over time that that my my circle, my hoop of learning, if you will, was a little bit broken. That I was starting from a store, um, and not and not some of the other things. So this talk has a few kind of lessons that I've put together. A uh, part of them through through the job that I've had. You know, I've been in the woods for about tw you know twenty five years, kind of thing. Um, and I've also, uh, oh my gosh, that makes me sound so old. 
um, also through the SCA and stuff. So the first lesson is, is that not all our teachers are meant to be human. And it was a, a woman by the name of uh, Dr. Pavel, who's down in Washington said that to me. And, and it's true that on some level we are meant to go into the forest and we are meant to explore. And there's things there that no one can teach us, that we're, we're meant to do those things. Um, and there's a lot there to learn. And so there's things that I can't teach you from this presentation. So if you get out there, if you can. Um, so there's three general dye sources, I would say. One is our local forest, which is what I'm gonna focus on today. There's also grocery stores. There's things there that you can you can uh, forage for very inexpensively. I can, I can tell you some of my tricks. And then of course, there's growing your own guy, dye garden which is kind of its own talk. I'm not really gonna cover that today, but those are some sources that you can do that bypasses the store, um, well, except for the grocery store, I suppose. So when we tend to think of foraging, I think many of us think berries. So these are three of the sort of the biggest berries around here that we get from our forest, which is salmonberry, thimbleberry and huckleberries. Um, but there's more out there and that's what we're gonna cover today. So these are sort of three taxa. So one is mushrooms, one is plants, and one are lichens. And so we're going to go through what exactly those are and what you can use to dye. So everything on the screen right now are dyers. The, the mushroom, which is a coral mushroom, is called Romeria. Um, that actually gives you a vibrant purple. But oddly enough, you have to use it right away. You can, this is, it cannot be stored or dried or frozen. For plants, this is goldenrod, which is a, a native plant, at least up here. I'm not sure if you guys have it down in Oregon. You get brilliant yellows. And this lichen is called Avernia prunastria. You, you find it a lot on hardwoods that grow in urban areas. So cherry wood, apples, um, maples. Uh, so after a good windstorm, you can go and collect. And I'll show you what kind of colors you can get when you collect it. So plants, by definition, these are organisms that are solar powered. So if it's an organism, that can take sunlight and make it into sugars using chlorophyll, it's a plant. And it's the basis of most terrestrial ecosystems. And obviously the plants come in a variety of sizes. Shocking. And so in terms of what you can die with, um, there's a huge seasonality to plants. There's different things happening at different times of year and you can get different colors. You can do things like use the whole plant, which is like lupin, which I've got a picture of later and that gives you green. For flowers, there's golden rods. There's also cones of trees. So alder cones can give you like a super, super dark chocolate brown. Um, berries, pokeberry is a classic example. It's a little further east, but it's brilliant fuchsia dye. It's actually, for, for being a berry, it's quite stable. There's the inner bark, which is um, a lot of pre-contact dyeing was, was with bark. This is alder and hemlock. So, uh, and a lot of this is harvest. You wanna harvest in winter time. I realize now I've got it in Celsius, so you'll have to do the Fahrenheit. At seven Celsius and below, if anyone can do the math on that quickly <laughs> in terms of Fahrenheit, maybe they can post it to the chat. You can post that to the chat, is when the sap inside stops. It stops flowing and that's when you can harvest the bark. Of course, being conscious of doing that in a way that doesn't affect the tree or hurt the tree. Uh, in terms of roots, uh, the picture in the upper right-hand corner is uh, Oregon grape root. Oregon grape is a, is a local shrub. Um, when you peel it with a peeler, you'll get that luminous yellow dye inside. And also bulbs like bulbs, like onions and bulrush. Um, there's a few other bulbs around that can give you color. There we go. The math is just cold. Seven Celsius is 44 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. So mushrooms cannot use sunlight by definition to get sugars. They are also called fungi. I like calling them mushrooms because I think it's more fun. Then they are decomposers. These are, oh my goodness, it's my daughter. Um, these are organisms that take organic matter and break it down into its, <laughs> until its chemical composition. Um, so things like nitrogen, phosphorus, all of those things are uh, freed up in the forest. Yes, Maya. Those mushrooms are called sulfur tufts. And while they're very poisonous, they give a beautiful yellow. And they're out right now. Thank you. I'm going to message your dad and see if your dad might be able to come and grab you. Here we go. Can daddy. you grab Maya? <laughs> this <laughs> is slightly <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so these are the fruiting bodies of larger, larger organisms that live in the soil. <laughs> there we go. We've got another little person um, that live in the soil. 
Um, and science is once again catching up with indigenous knowledge, which is that uh, fungi anchor and protect trees and the forest. So I'm going to check in there a little bit, drill into this a little bit, because the science is very, very cool right now. There's a lot of cutting edge uh, stuff that's coming out. All the little people. OK, so the next slide. Um, so what we've known for a long time is something called mycorrhizal relationships. And the idea is that sugar is that trees. So what we know is that um, trees make more sugars than they need, and they disperse those to fungi in, in the forest floor. And the fungi are making more of these base compounds that they need, and they pass those to the tree. So there's a kind of a give and take happening there, a symbiotic relationship. But what we now know, and what's getting more and more interesting, and this is really cutting edge stuff, is that the, true, the, the fungi are connected to a whole bunch of trees. And if there's a tree that gets sick in their network, they'll take sugars from other trees and send them to the sick tree. So they're really actively managing the forest, um, which is really, you know, it's kind of really cool stuff. Um, the other thing I was just reading last night is um, danger signals come in. So if a tree gets injured at all, it can actually will send those danger signals throughout the, the, the mycorrhizal relationship fungi highway. It's very cool stuff happening. So dye mushroom season, we're, we're right in the middle of dye mushroom season. It's, um, it runs August to November. It's um, identification so of mushrooms can be very tricky. It can be, um, it's not just what something looks like, it can be based on what something smells like. Like, there we go. The chanterelles, for example, should have a fruity smell. There's ones that look like chanterelles, but they don't smell fruity and so things like that. What they even taste like, um, what, they, um, what they're growing on, if it's growing on a Douglas fir versus a birch, that can help you. In terms of, and uh, I've got just a note here about the Puget Sound Mycological Society, which has been great. Um, and I know down in Oregon, you guys have your own Oregon micro Mycological Society. So there's always some society around that you can connect with that'll get you going in terms of identification. So that's kind of a great place to start. Around here, so we've got the Vancouver Mycological Society, which probably helps nobody in this call, but at least up here, um, there's fall teaching forays, there's monthly talks, and then online identification. And a lot of this is online right now, but hopefully that will change uh, in future. So, so why do these organisms create mushrooms in the first place? What, what tells you, what, the reason is if we look underneath the mushroom. So what mushrooms are doing is, is creating, they like lots and lots of surface areas underneath the structure to disperse spores. And so those spores meet other spores and create new mushrooms. And so either the, they can have, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but for example, this looks like a Paxilla on the lower left. These are gills, these are gill structures. These are the folds over here. Um, with probably the person with the best name ever is Fluffburger, that's their real name. Took this photo with the pores, is thinking of the pores. Um, up above, this is called a Hydnellum, Hydnellum pecii, which is a gray mushroom. It's probably one of my favorites when you see it on the, on the forest floor. Like there's no better mushroom for Halloween than a bloody tooth, Hydnellum pikei. Um, and you can see they have these little structures. These are what we call teeth underneath. Um, there's more gills. And then there's just great big, what we call polypores or conchs. Um, and this one is just sort of, it just gets layer upon layer um, to create those, the, that big surface area. So that's what's happening. And these are what, what people collect for different reasons, off, most often for foraging, for food, some people for hallucinogenic reasons and others for dying or medicinal reasons, I suppose. So the third group, so we've done plants, we've done mushrooms, and the third one is lichen. So what is a lichen? Um, it's a, it, what it is, it's a structure that's a symbiotic relationship with one algae and then two lichens over top of it. And it's kind of an interesting story. We used to think it was one algae and one lichen. And then there was a guy with almost no educational background in a trailer park and the Eastern seaboard looked at these under a microscope and realized it was actually two um, fungi together and basically overturned like 150 years of science. And that's a really exciting thing about mushrooms and lichens is almost no one is studying them. So it's kind of where we were like 200 years ago with plants, like it's that far behind. So if you want to create, if you want to discover new species, go into mushrooms. It's really, it's kind of this weird last frontier. Generally these grow on trees and are rocks or rocky outcroppings. Um, and there's two ways we get color. One is called the boiled water method. 
And this is for your oranges, your yellows, your browns, which is what it sounds like. It's just boiling it in water. And the other is fermenting. And that's when you add lichen into, into like a vat. And by vat, I mean, a, I, I just use a plastic um, apple juice container with a little top. I used to use glass, but there was an incident and my husband said, no way, so now they're plastic. You know, it's not very authentic, but whatever, it, it works, it balances better. Um, so so when, the, when you're fermenting that, and that's how you get your purples, your pinks, your fuchsias, your reds from, from lichens that way. Um, and also this or, these organisms, they're often very slow growing um, and you have to be, you have to harvest them ethically and we're gonna cover how to harvest ethically in a little bit. So this is an example, this is a Vernia prunastria. So this is the one after a big windstorm, you'll see it a lot of like boulevards under hard, hardwood trees. So if you stick it in, this is a, you know, our plastic apple juice container, um, half, fill it half full of ammonia and half full of water and leave it, give it a shake every, you know, once a day kind of thing. And it'll start going purple. And these are some of the colors you can get from it. So that's something that you can go and harvest just easily uh, even in the middle of urban centers and, and in cities. So this is on to lesson two, which is if possible, always create outside. And this is something we kind of know in the SCA. Um, these two pictures come from, there's an event um, in the Bar in Hel uh, Helsinki in Finland, which is the barony of, uh, sorry, my brain. But, um, and they do sort of like an event for a week and so this is uh, uh, this is dying. So the, the one on the right is us doing indigo vat day, and um, on the left we have um, this is how they smoke um, salmon over there. And it's always great. It's always great to get outside. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is if you are somebody from what we call a targeted or a marginalized group, whether it's from a visual, visual or whatever it is, your orientation. You not you don't always feel safe and you aren't always as safe as other people in the woods and that can be discouraging in terms of foraging and there are some groups um facebook foraging groups that have really begun to lead in this way and so one for example is the pacific northwest mushroom identification facebook group and now they encourage you know they have queer positive forages for example that are by and for members of targeted groups to actually go out and be able to enjoy the woods and be able to learn um, and put safety measures in place um, in new ways that we didn't have before. So I would really encourage you to, if that's something that you feel comfortable with, um, seeking them out. I'm not sure how it's happening now with COVID, of course, but um, you know, you can at least uh, have a look at that. I just wanted to mention that. I know the woods are different for different people. So this picture, um, there's a, a, a pretty much the world expert on mushroom dyeing is out of Seattle. Her name is Alyssa Allens. And she was she teaches like a three day dye class. So she was up here. So this photo is from her class. And these are all mushrooms and lichens. So what I thought we could do sort of very quickly is go through every color of the rainbow. And I'm just going to show you some of your options, because I think some people think okay, there's just browns or yellows, but there actually is lots happening out there. So here it goes. So how do I get a true red, which is also a color very valued by um, First Nations groups around here? Here it is. Here's the bad news. When you, <laughs> when you get into mushroom dyeing, um, mushrooms, you kind of need to know the scientific name. You, you can't keep using common names because not a lot of people use them. And also there's a strong trading culture and if you're, if you're trading, you need to know exactly what you have and exactly what you're trading for. So these are three mushrooms. In a, in a scientific name, you have the first one name and the second name. So the first one is the genus, which is like the group of species. And the second name is the species. So for example, these are all what we call quaternarius mushrooms. They're, all the, they're called the red quartz. They're very prized. They're, and these are out right now. So if, this is, if red is your color, this is what's happening in the woods right now. Um, as you can see, the one at the top is all red. The top, the gills, and the stem is, or the semis, is all red. The one in the middle, the cap is just red. And the semi-sanguineous at the bottom, it's just the gills. It's the same pigment, but it has different concentrations for each of the species. And you can mix those together in the dye pot. It'll give you the same red. Um, you can get reds with red alder bark. Uh, I've seen reds given it. I, I've, done, I've started getting into um, cedar bark dyeing. I have not managed to get a red using red alder bark on wool. That's not to say that you can't. I just haven't managed it yet, but I thought I'd, I would put that in the presentation. In terms of orange, 
putting the slide together made me realize I'm not trying for orange very often. It's not one of those colors for what, and I like orange, but you don't really, you're not usually dying for it for whatever reason. Um, if you look at the colors on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see there's a good orange kind of up from red a couple. That's the same red mushrooms I showed, but with a splash of vinegar. When you make that dye pot more acidic, lower the pH, you'll get a bright orange. Another way to get orange is here on, oops, it zoomed in somehow, there we go. To get um, orange on the left hand side, that's a kind of mushroom. It's also right now called lobster mushrooms. So here you go, the two at the top. Um, so lobster is an interesting kind of mushroom. It's, um, it parasitizes an, a mushroom on the inside. So the mushroom inside is white, it doesn't do anything. So when we, when we harvest it, we skin that. Um, and then we, um, we skin the lobster and then we dry. I have a dehydrator, which is useful when you get into mushroom dyeing and mushroom stuff. Um, so I dry it and then I take those shavings and then I dye with my, in my vat. And that really helps kind of give me good concentrated color. You can get a great orange just with tap water and with that. Um, and then lichens, you can use usnea, which is also a really common lichen. You, you find it not just in the forest, but in um, on boulevards and stuff as well. And that gives you kind of a rusty yellow. And then, like I said, that cordinarius with acid, with like a vinegar can give you that orange as well. So here we are with yellow. Lots of stuff gives you yellow. <clears throat> so some of the mushrooms, the these are bolites in the lower, bolitas zellerii in the lower left-hand corner. These are mushrooms just from my front yard. So I harvest them, I peel off those pores and I just dry those pores. Um, in the middle, here's goldenrod over here on the right. This is a kind of mushroom, it's huge. And it's funny, if, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago if I'd ever seen it before, I would have said no. And now I see it every time I'm out in the woods. It's everywhere and it's you find it in connections with um, Western hemlock. You find them on stumps, Western hemlock. Um, and if you add a little so yellow, you can get really about 30 different shades. It's a really versatile, really concentrated, uh, in the, which is why it's called Dyer's Polypore. Lots and lots of color there. Here, this is the um, Oregon grape root, and then also things like onion. And, and I think these, so this slide here, I just kind of wanted to address the idea of exhaust baths. So you've done all this work, you've foraged for the stuff. Um, when you do your first dye, you're gonna get your color. If you keep going, you'll actually get more shades and it's lazy. And if we can't be like, I'd rather be lazy, right? So why not? So if you dye with onion skins and I'll, and I'll tell you my secret, cause I'm cheap, this is what I do. So I go to the store and we have a, a setup at our local grocery store that has shallots, which are like small onions and they're a really good dyer. So I'll go to the shallots and I get all the skins and I shove the skins in like the little, little bag, sh 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 and then I put one shallot in and one shallot is about 26 cents. So I get this big bag for 26 cents. And then I just do that every, every grocery shop. Um, and so I have lots and lots of bags ready to go. That's what I do. You guys can steal my idea. So if you have one to one, so you have a, a pound of wool, a pound of dried skin, you're gonna get a deep, deep brown. But if you take that out and try again, you're gonna get into the golds. So those are those are easy way to get two colors and it's a beautiful gold, it's a, it's a great dyer. Um, greens, you kind of have two different shades. So on the, on the right hand side of your screen, on the right and the bottom, these are called lupins and they like really disturbed habitats. So you'll see them next to highways, dirt roads, gravel roads. Um, you want to harvest them before they flower. So before they flower, they're super concentrated. And if you want 300%, which is for every pound of wool, you want three pounds of lupin. And if you dye that, um, you see this middle lupin with iron. So at the end of your dyeing, you add a splash of iron. You don't add too much iron because it's hard on the wool, but just a little bit will give you the sort of beautiful minty green. And if you're into olive greens, you're going to um, add a little bit of iron. So adding, I don't really go into it too much with this talk, but it, when you add different metals with your with your dyeing, you can change the color. You can kind of do a bunch of fun stuff. So with this is Dyer's Polypore. These are four shades with Dyer's Polypore. If you want the greens, you're gonna need to add a little bit of iron. And you can also do um, alder cones or some, some greens there. We did just have a question come up. When we're talking oh. about iron, um, are we talking about liquid iron? What what is the what is the formula? Yeah. Iron? So I I it's, I go through. I am at this stage more interested in just the chemistry and I know what works. So uh, we have a shop here that sells natural dye uh, called Maya. You can probably get stuff on Amazon, which is ferrous sulfate, which is, which is just like a powder 
and you want 6%. So I know you guys don't work in grams, but if I had a hundred grams of wool, I want six grams. So it's, it's with aluminum <laughs> or, or what we call alum, you want 15, but with wool, you, iron, you need a lot less because iron is really hard on wool. So for different kinds of mordants, you can get them online. And then you can also, there are some plants that have a high aluminum content and iron. Um, so if you're really hardcore, you can also forage for your mordants, which is more hardcore than I am generally because it takes a lot of time. So um, I get mine online. And, and, but there are people that do like rusty nails and you can do rusty stuff, but you've got to be careful. If it's too rusty, it'll chew up your yarn. If there's not enough rust, if there's not enough iron, it won't die properly. So it's a bit more of a risk, but it's, it's certainly kind of a more fun, interesting way to go. I think there's a, people call it hippie dyeing, which is when you throw stuff in a pot. And I think hippie dyeing is a really important part of dyeing and it, it lets you try different things. So, you know, go, go with what works. And dyers polypore with iron. So this is the color we don't really have a word for in English. It's kind of a third green, a third gray and a third blue. When you see it, um, some people call it glaucus, but it's still, it's not quite the right word. And so what you get here, this is from what we call the hydnellums, which are the mushrooms that have the little teeth on the bottom. People also call them hedgehogs, which is sarcodon um, or hawkswing is another name. And those are just about to come out. Kind of a muted teal, not, I don't know, like there's more gray here than in a teal. But you can die with it and you guys can tell me what you think. I, when I die with it, I'm like, I don't know what to call this, I like it. So lots of these mushrooms are coming up and I actually have them here. So local mushrooms from Healthy Forest, Hydnellums we talked about, Omphalotus, which I think maybe is more your guys's. We don't really get Omphalotus up here. Um, that's like my favorite color. I agree, isn't it a great color? And Sarcodon, Sarcodon is the hawkswing. Um, and these are the tooth porter gill mushrooms. So, um, and like I said, we're just getting into this season. So if you like this color, um, you can get some pretty, pretty interesting stuff happening. Um, and then we talk, so we're we'll doing the rainbow and the one is into blue and blue is kind of hard to get, right? Like a true blue. I started getting into dyeing with Coast Salish weavers, which we can talk about in a second, but I, I was interested in how we get blue. So this is a book. Oh, this is an SCA talk. So let me, let me give you kind of an interesting aspect of research. Somewhere between 1600 and 1700. So this is long before contact with Europeans here. There was a village called the, what we call now the Ozette village in the Olympic Peninsula. So this is very Northwestern tip of Washington. And there was a terrible mudslide and the whole village was covered. And when the archeologists were excavating the village, they found a Coast Salish blanket. Well, I'm gonna show you a picture of the Coast Salish blanket in a second. In that blanket, there was a dark blue. So we know that they had a dark blue but we don't know how they had a dark blue, right? So, but they had it from somewhere, either they traded it, who knows? And when I read, her, so this is Paula Gustafson who wrote a book um, in, in 1981 called Coast Salish Weaving. And she says in it, there is no dye material indigenous to the Pacific Northwest that gives true shades of blue using native plants or minerals as dye stuff. And I thought, well, well great, but what about this find where we know for a fact you know, it predates European contact by all, like about over a hundred years. So how, where did it come from? And I don't know the answer. And that's the other thing about Coast Salish textiles. No one has looked at the dyes, specifically the dyes. And so it's kind of neat to think about. This is a close-up of a Coast Salish blanket. It came to the museum, the National Finnish Museum in, in 1826. Modern dyes are created in Europe in the 1850s. We know the colors in this blanket have to be from natural sources. There's no other option by the time this blanket made it to the museum. So this blanket is from somewhere in the Pacific Northwest because the, the people, the Europeans who were on the, on the ships didn't take, take, take careful notes. So it's just traded blanket, you know, whatever. And I can see from this blanket with my own eyes, there is blue in it. This blanket would be a mixture of, of mountain goat and Coast Salish woolly dog. So where does this blue come from, right? I'm going somewhere with this. This lichen is called Xanthoria peripatina or the maritime or yeah, marine sunburst lichen. Now this lichen is weird. So it's bright yellow, as you can see, it's very common and it feeds on nitrogen, which means it, it's one of the very few lichens that likes pollution. 
So if you're on the I-5, if you're heading into Seattle from the north, you'll see on the, of those big overpasses and they're quite yellow, they're yellow with this lichen. So if you, so what I do, um, especially after, like I said, after a big windstorm, you're, if you get branches that fall and then you can harvest. So I don't harvest from live trees, but if you get a branch that falls, this lichen's dead, it can't live on the ground. So that's a time to harvest it. So you harvest the lichen and you put it in your container with either, I have urine, I wouldn't recommend it. I would recommend uh, household ammonia and water and the liquid turns a cherry red. Great. The cherry red liquid dyes bubblegum pink. Great. You bring this into sunlight, it's photosensitive. It goes blue. So is that the right blue? I don't know. Um, here's, here's some more of it. So it's an interesting source of blue. And I would think that before kind of the, the really the advent of science, if somebody were to dye it pink and get blue in the sunlight, it would have been a pretty magical, magical, and it is magically anyway, even knowing the science is still magical. So into the pinks and purples, these are mushrooms and lichens and either you're fermenting with lichens. So the, the one on the left, this is an umbilicariate, which I'm going to show you the purple in the upper middle is from Tapanella. That's a mushroom. It's still out right now. It's kind of the end of Tapanella season. It's also called velvet packs or velvet footed mushroom. The purple in the lower center is called Hapalopolis. If you're around a lot of birch trees, um, this is a polypore on birches. Be aware it's highly toxic. It's very poisonous. So you've got to be very careful if you harvest it and you're storing it, please be aware of that. And then the picture on the right is the same as the Avernia picture I showed you already. So what does that look like? So here I am, this is me at a site on one of the golf, we call it golf islands. You guys call them something else off the west, off the Washington coast. These are, so this is umbilicariate. It's quite a big lichen. If you can see it on my hand, it's quite a substantial one. So um, I harvest enough for very small projects. I don't harvest a lot of this. And even then I, it's so slow growing. I, I haven't harvested even it for a while and I might, I might not harvest it at all. So you, you put it in your vat. This is when I was dying with glass before the incident. So there we go. And it goes, you sort of, you shake it every once in a while and it goes that purple. Um, and then you get this. And this is actually a Viking age dye. We know from Viking age analysis, they had this lichen. Um, and so these are leg wraps I did for my husband. Yeah, it's not the most light fast one. So if you just spend a lot of time in the sunlight, it's going to fade. But we have this feeling, you know, in the SCA, oh, purple was reserved for upper class and, you know, the royal purple. Not so in the, at least with the Viking age, um, there's lots of purple wa wandering around. So, so you know, there we are. Sorry, I forgot I had this picture thrown in. So as you can see, um, it's him and his step down and looking a little ragged. Um, and those are the leg wraps. So those are Viking age dyed leg wraps, bright purple. This is a close up of another Coast Salish blanket. And I'm not covering Coast Salish weaving or anything in this talk, but just for the sake of argument, this blanket was woven in the 1920s or 30s. And right now it's listed in the museum as being commercially dyed, which it might be, it might be commercially dyed. There's been, keep in mind on the Coast Salish blankets, there's been no analysis of the dyes, but that's what it's listed as. This is called pokeberry. It's found uh, east of here. And this is the color it gives. It's pretty close. Like it's a pretty close that, it's a really distinctive fuchsia. So, um, and pokeberry is a little bit of a unique berry. Often the berries, will dye like a purple, but it fades to gray very quickly. Pokeberry is quite a stable dye. It's kind of a unique berry that way. Um, it's also um, poisonous. So keep that in mind, especially for dogs. So people put them in their gardens, but just be, be aware it's quite a poisonous berry. What about black? There's oral traditions here of placing fleece hides in black clay or mud for extended periods. You can also get a very dark brown with iron and red alder cones. You can use tin and iron. If you're, I can get a true, like a true black with logwood, which is a South American dye with, with iron. You can get a, a true black if you're interested. Um, and then I just want to touch on ethical wild crafting for non-Indigenous folks. So in British Columbia, and this is probably different than in Washington and Oregon, so make sure you're, you're obeying all your, all the laws. You can harvest on private land. What we call up here is leased crown land, which is, you know, if you're out in the bush and there's those logging roads that go to, to the timber blocks. I don't, I, don't know what you guys, I don't know what you guys call them. Um, up here we call them leased uh, crown land. Um, everybody has the ability to go in and harvest along those roads. And we have what we call here, and this is the legal technical term is Indian reserves. I know you guys call them reservations, but if you have permission of the nation, you're also allowed to harvest there with permission. 
Um, and then there's three general rules of wild crafting that we would always want to obey, which is number one, don't kill something when you can just take a part. Don't take more than you need. And don't take more than the population can stand, which is especially true with lichens. You've got to be very aware of it. And really generally, I try to steer people away from rock lichens and just do the windfall lichens. You can get all the colors you need you can get from there. On to lesson three. Foraging for dyes isn't about finding what you want, it's about finding what's available. And what I mean is when you head out, you often have a very specific thing in mind. And I think when you go into the woods with that mindset, you're risking over harvesting whatever it is. And it's much better to head out and this is what you find. There's a really strong trading culture. There's something called the the mushroom dyers trading post online it's a facebook group and you can trade things back and forth like do it that way so explore appreciate identify collect ethically dry and store grow your stash and down the road you'll have more than enough colors to dye share and trade and so that's what i would encourage and that kind of helps me keep a healthy mindset when i'm in the woods as well um, and how to get started also what if foraging isn't possible or pre preferable not everybody physically is able to head out and forage. So what are, what are some of your options? Um, there are dye workshops. There's local workshops here. This note is for Vancouver, British Columbia, which is my West. Um, we run, uh, it, they run, I should say, natural dye workshops twice a year. There's stuff going on. I would definitely check out Alyssa Allen. She runs a, a group called uh, Myco Pigments, Myco from Mushrooms. Um, and she's running, she runs lots of workshops and she's starting to go online now. I, I saw, I've She's been posting about her setup in, in her kitchen. So there's stuff coming that way too. Um, yeah, there she is on sounds. Um, useful books. So these are some of the books that are in my library. These are books that I use a lot and I would recommend are a great starting point um, if you're a book person. So the number one is Rainbow Beneath My Feet, uh, Mushroom Dyer's Field Guide. The only thing to be aware of, it's a little outdated for scientific names and a lot of it's, it has the same gap that a lot of earlier dyeing books have, which it doesn't really deal with pH. And if you're a little bit aware of pH, you can radically shift what kind of colors you get. So it's something to keep in mind. It's still a great book to start. Um, the second one is Harvesting Color, which is set up by season, which I really like. The only drawback to it is it's for North America. So um, I'd really love for a book to be for the Pacific Northwest. That's something I've been thinking about anyway. In terms of specifically mushrooms, there's two mushroom books. One is the Mushrooms Demystified, which is a great book, but it's a, quite a big substantial book. <laughs> yes, there we go. Um, and the other one is called All the Rain Promises and More. And the great thing is they're from the same author. Um, and so I take All the Rain Promises and More with me. And if you wanna open up and just show that inside cover, there's that great like little flow chart does it have this? Yes or no? Does it have that? Yes or no? And it kind of takes you through without needing a lot of technical knowledge and it gets you like the right section of the book. And then the little pocket book will say, see this part of this much bigger book, Mushrooms Demystified, which is too big to carry with you. So, and I also like that All the Rain Promises and More doesn't take itself too seriously, which you can probably tell by looking at the cover, which is a guy with a trombone and a, and a big mushroom. So, I think, I think he's got Shen Charles there. So um, it's a fun book. It doesn't take itself too seriously. This, sh this is not a serious you know, topic. Uh, this one uh, is for British Columbia, but it's probably still works if you're in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of our Bible up here in terms of plant names and, and lichens, more into plants. It's set up beautifully. Whatever your plant book, you, you really want to have something that has maps um, to help get a zero in on the region. And this last one is if you're, if you are interested um, in the people of the Pacific Northwest and you're interested in Coast Salish, this is a new book. It's actually written by Coast Salish people about their own robes. And so it just came out, I think it came out two years ago and it's, it's a good one. So other resources, there's the Puget Sound Mycological Society, the Oregon Mycological Society. Um, there's a free app called iNaturalist, which is great to have in the woods with you. And so what you can do is you can access the app from wherever you are and it'll show you a photo photos around of where people have been around you and have photographed and identified things. Um, and it's, it's really helpful. I wouldn't use it to figure out if I'm gonna eat a mushroom or not. That's not what it's good for, but it's good to identify things. I'm seeing some scary stuff. One of the things I'm noticing online is some people heading into the woods. I'm gonna, let's just pause the presentation for a moment because I'm really disturbed by this. We have people heading into the woods, harvesting everything they find for mushrooms into a mound 
photographing the mound, putting the mound on social media and asking people what they should eat and then people weighing in on which mushrooms they should eat. And then the people go and eat these mushrooms. That's a terrible idea. Be aware, eating the wrong mushroom, it's, you, it, it can kill you, but, or maybe it won't kill you, but you need a liver transplant or a kidney transplant. Like, don't do this. You need to be very sure of what you're doing, please, <laughs> please. All right, there we go, that's my spiel. There's four Facebook groups that I use a lot that I just thought I would share. One is the Mushroom and Lichen, Lichen Dyers United. It's a great resource. It's, at, it's a very active group. And if you find something and you can identify it and you're not sure what colors you're gonna get, you can type the name and it'll come up with everybody with their photos of dying with it and it can help you. Um, it's a really useful, I, I use it kind of in sneaky ways, um, but it's kind of been my go-to. Um, if you're interested in trading, Mushroom Dyer's trading post is very active, especially for the state of Washington. There's lots and lots of people and Oregon, I suppose, and British Columbia the trading stuff. So things like maybe you have luxury yarn or maybe you have honey or maybe you have tinned salmon or you have something else. There's people there with dye mushrooms that want to trade with you. There's no money. You can't buy anything. So it's kind of SCA wise. It's kind of like a good bartering trade system. It's, it, it works. Um, the other one that's just great is the Pacific Northwest Mushroom Identification Forum. And if you go there, you will see that their banner is Black Lives Matter. They have been, for whatever reason, one of the forerunners in, in making themselves very clear where they stand and uh, really hope, trying to get as many people out in the, in the woods as possible. I have a lot of respect for how, how they've handled um, some of the modern politics and stuff. I, another group which has a, a lot of um, Coast Salish weavers is the Pacific Northwest Natural Dyers Group. I'm one of the admins of that group. And this, heartbreaking, this was supposed to be this year. This is just supposed to be wrapping up. Um, every two years, there's something called the International Fungi and Fiber Symposium. So it was in um, Norway, I guess two years ago. Um, and it's in Port Townsend, Washington. So just over the border on, on our side, it's on your side, just at the border. Um, and it'll be this time next year and tickets go on sale in January. And it's a week of intensive mushroom dyeing, foraging, teaching. Um, there's lots of stuff happening. So that's just putting that out there. If, if mushroom dyeing, you think you're interested, this is, this is gonna give you to kind of next level stuff. Fourth lesson. By far, natural dyeing is the easiest textile art to thrive in the presence of young children because you're already in the kitchen making fish sticks. I don't know about you, if people in the, in the SCA and you have kids and you suddenly can't sit on the couch and knit and you can't sit on the couch and weave and those things that you used to do with your evenings, that just isn't happening. For whatever reason, dyeing is not one of those things because if you're in the kitchen, you're in the kitchen so much anyway, if you have some, if you've got your dye pots in the back of the stove doing their thing, I do more dyeing now and I have three little kids than I ever did before. So take heart if you're feeling like you can't do what you used to do and you're kind of stressed out about it. Try this. It, it worked for me. It kept, it's, it's really kept my, my sort of creative energy going. And part two, children are national, natural mushroom detectors. Put them to work. They're close to the ground. If you're foraging, you're going slowly anyway. My kids love heading out and we and we talk about mushrooms in there. They're great. They see, they see more mushrooms than I do, right? So I just wanted to touch kind of at the end about like some of the work I've been doing. I kind of put in sort of the minimum so that we can all be on the same page. So when I say what when I say Coast Salish, what does that mean? So if you look at the map, these Coast Salish is more of a language group and that within that there are different people that have very distinct um, cultures. Um, and I'm up there in the, what's called the Downriver Halkaminum group. That's, that's the languages around here. You guys are in different ones. Um, and then and it's all Coast Salish. And so I'm not covering Coast Salish textiles today, but the talk doesn't make sense unless you can see this. So these are three of those blankets that came to the museums prior to modern dyes. So we know that all of these dyes are from natural sources. As you can see, if we if we kind of zoom in a little bit, there's lots of different colors in there happening. There's the reds and the blues, and I'm really, really interested to kind of see about uh, sort of maybe looking at, at different ways. I'm, I'm looking at doing a, a possibly a PhD on it um, at UBC. So I'm looking at applying. Applications are open November 15th, so I can let you guys know how that goes. But we don't know a lot about it, and I think I think it would be it would be really fun to uh, to look more into that. So I was happily dying my way in the SCA 
minding my own business with my early sort of pre-Christian European stuff. And I get an email from um, a master Coast Salish weaver named Deborah Sparrow. And that's Deborah there. And so she says, hey, I hear you do this thing. Would you ever be interested in, in collaborating uh, on a blanket in that you would do the dyeing for the blanket? And I was like, heck yeah, I would. That sounds amazing. So she said, okay, I'm doing a blanket and it's for um, a drug rehabilitation center for youth, which is, oh, okay, this is a big deal. Okay, so it's, she's doing a blanket for a youth rehabilitation center. And I have absolutely no idea how to get colors in, in a way that would honor doing a Coast Salish blanket. Like I don't, at this stage, I only knew dying in the SCA. And so in this blanket, which hangs in the center is all Viking age dyes. Cause that's all I knew. So these colors, in this, in this Coast Salish blanket are all Viking age because that's what I gave her. And she was happy with that. So it was after this blanket that I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, I gotta, I gotta get my act together. This is embarrassing. So this is really what started me on the path of how do I walk into my woods? Like, okay, I get great. Like Viking age is great. And maybe if I was in Sweden, I could do this stuff, but I know I'm not in Sweden. Like I'm here, what can, what can I do? And so I started going on a different route. So this is the second, so she came to me again and she's like, I'm doing a yellow blanket. So I did all sorts of experiments and um, figure out different different ways to make yellow. And so this was her her blanket uh, that she wove from some of my yellows. Um, and then she said, I'm doing a purple blanket. And so I did purple blankets of which some of the colors here are um, are from lichens. And that's my daughter, Maya, wearing wearing her the blanket that she made. Um, and then I think I have one more blanket. So then she said, I need, I need greens and I need rust. So um, I, ah, so she hands, so she spins and then she gives me these hat, these big skeins. It's a bit daunting. So I take them and then I do colors and then there she is um, having woven it, having wo woven it uh, just finishing it up. So that has been a really, a really fun thing to be, a, to be a part of. Um, it's been fun. Um, from here, um, this is my friend Rita Comp. She's she's from Musqueam, and we are doing a a blended mushroom dyeing and Coast Salish dyeing um, workshops for the first time at just next month. It's going to be fun. So I think I think to wrap up, hopefully hopefully it's been useful. Um, I hope you feel inspired to explore what's out there with new eyes. Dyeing here is ancient, whether with minerals, plants, metals, lichens, and mushrooms. Modernly, um, mushroom and lichen dyeing is a relatively new field. It really just started up in the 1980s and there's new colors and new stuff being dis dis uh, discovered all the time. Um, and there's lots of online communities and resources to get you started. And that's my talk. Anyone have any questions? We have had a couple come through. Okay. Um, Somebody, uh, Marl had asked, can you boil your dyes, dye with them, and then ferment them and dye again? No, I think they're, they would be exhausted at that stage. I think you've, you've probably used them up. They're probably ready for the compost. Ferments are like either boil or ferment, and I haven't ever come across one that actually is both. Just to interject oh, sorry, on that. Maybe I sorry, maybe I misunderstood you. Do you mean, can you, what's it like, can you can either boil or ferment? Sorry, maybe I misunderstood your mm -hmm. question. No, this one, she's, I think she's asking about reusing the same dye because okay. she's a separate, a separate process to, to prepare them. Yeah, um, basically I'm, I'm asking it from the point of view of if I find a mystery mushroom or lichen and I don't know if it's any yeah. good as a dye or not, do I have right. to split it into two batches and try it once each way or can I do oh, I see one saying, batch? No, whatever. good news is no. So what I would do if I was you is I would get a little, um, a little dropper bottle and have bleach in it. And if you have lichens, what you can do is, uh, is scratch a little bit of the surface off and add a drop of that bleach. And if it goes pink or purple in the field, you know you can ferment with it and get those colors. So that's, that's, that's that one. And there's no real way to get the, the boiled water. It's just like, just you gotta kind of do it the hard way. Um, there are lichen dyeing books. Um, I could maybe send those along to, to you guys about that. Um, and then they have listed in the back. But again, you kind of need to know the species. So um, there are lichen books that can help you. There's Lichens of the Pacific Northwest, which is a book that I have. I'm by Bruce McCune. The Stuff That Blows Down Off the Roof and Onto My Balcony. Okay. <laughs> Who, who's, your, who's your lichens of the PNW by? It's called Macro Lichens of the Pacific Northwest. 
Yes, that's the one. Um, it's and by it's Bruce. By, McC yeah, Bruce, Bruce McEwen and Linda Geyser. They're pro Geyser. they're professors down at Oregon State. I had them as teachers. So yeah, it, like, that, I'm that's like super. The, that's the book we use up here. That's I'm there's super no better geeking book. out about the books over. So it's like <laughs> you can also get big that are just like in keys. They're really technical and really hard to use. Like you need to really be a lichenologist to use them. So I would suggest that book instead. <laughs> One question I've got is harvesting the inner bark safe for trees? And the answer is you need to know the answer is depends on the tree. So different trees have different widths you can harvest and different ways you can harvest. So you're going to need to speak to somebody with like what exactly why are you harvesting and what do you need and then finding someone who can help you with that. I will tell you that for red alder, ours have been blowing down on a fairly regular basis for the last several years. So just contact us after a windstorm. Yeah. We'll be <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, red alder is good. Uh, and red alder, you know, is one of those first trees. If, if there's if there's been a clearing, it's really comes in and regenerates this, the area, regenerates the soil, makes room for the conifers. But if you've got something like a western red cedar, which are really stressed because of climate change and we want to look after them, that's when it gets really touchy. Um, and the only reason you're going to harvest bark from a western cedar is to make sort of cedar bark items, which is again, you're getting into like a cultural, make sure you know what you're doing um, and go out with somebody at the right time of year. So I'm, I'm not going to answer the question. I'm going to suggest that you find somebody very specifically that you can work with. If they're poisonous, isn't it dangerous to taste them to identify them? If you're getting to the stage where you're tasting to identify, it's a very specific skill. You probably have a lot of mushroom knowledge already. Mushrooms are strange. They're not like plants. So things that are plants like devil's club or poison oak, when you touch them, you know you've done wrong. Like it hurts. <laughs> Mushrooms, you can, even the most poisonous mushroom, our, mo our poisonous, most poisonous mushroom up here is um, Amanita poloides, which is like the angel death mushroom or it has some sort of dramatic name. Um, you can actually pick those up. And if you go to a mushroom show, they often have this mushroom and you can physically hold them in your hands. And it's only when you ingest that it, things get, you know, that's really bad. Um, and so there are some experts who will put a little bit on their tongue and then spit it out. Um, I'm not, like, I'm a mushroom enthusiast. I'm not an expert and I am not at that stage yet. So I would certainly not recommend anybody putting stuff in their mouths who don't know what they're doing, but that's a good thing. When, if you go out, like if you go out on a mushroom walk with an expert and, and you know, let them show you how to do that, it's probably a good idea. There's a whole list of like steps of how you do it that I was yeah. taught once that I still don't want to do it. Like, you know, have a tiny bit. I agree with you. On your tongue and spit you. it out and then like eat a little bit. Like you're doing it over several days of the same thing and just don't. Just don't. <laughs> yeah. That works for me. Just die with it instead. Then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I do a lot of, um, if, I, if I think I've got something or I, like if you go through the Mushroom Dyers um, and also I should say Alyssa Allens, who's, who's kind of the world expert out of Seattle, she's writing a book. So there is a book coming about mushroom dyeing um, and like a dyeing that will go into a lot more detail, but it's not, I don't think she's finished the book yet. Um, anyone else have any questions? Oh, I Blue for China. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Could be, why not? And I was also seeing um, someone has brought up the uh, in the sisters interview you had mentioned dyes showing in in UV light, and they were asking if there was anything. Yeah. New on. I may have squealed rather loudly when Clovis was talking to me about this. <laughs> I decided I, I was either going to talk about that or some of the more modern stuff I was doing with Deborah, and I, I sort of went that route. Mushrooms. So there's something called fluoresce, which is different than bioluminous. So fluoresce means something is taking in UV light. So UV is a, is a part of the natural light spectrum. So it's part of sunlight, but we can't detect it with our eyes. So it takes in UV, it transforms it and it readmits it as visible light, which looks like it glows in the dark when you press a UV light. So it's basically you're at a right, you know, at a rave in the mid nineties, not that any of us would admit to doing that, but that's kind of the idea. And so you can do that with mushrooms and you can do that with mushroom dyed fiber. And I know, that some people have used UV light on plants to look at some of the historical dyeing of plants. And the reason to use light is that it's non, um, it doesn't destroy the fibrous, right? It's just shining a light for a very small amount of time on historical textiles. So it's a better way to go than the chemical analysis route. 
Um, but nobody, as far as I know, is using UV light to look at mushroom and lichen use. And so one of the things I am interested in is using that on some of the old Coast Salish blankets. And so one of the things I did, I talked about in the sisters interview, or the, 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 yeah, the sisters Laurel interview, is that I, that beautiful, I showed you kind of a close up of the blanket that's got the red and the blue. And I had them shine a UV light on the red and it shifts what happens to those fibers when you shine a UV light is the same thing that happens to those fibers dyed with those red cordonarius mushrooms. The same shift happens. So I'm wondering if that's evidence that it is cordonarius mushrooms that they were used to dye in that blanket. And so now I'm we're looking at possibly publishing that with the museum, what's called the Museum of Anthropology. So out here there's a big university called UBC um, and there's the Museum of Anthropology which is sort of houses a lot of the indigenous um, items. And so there's a a textile curator there who's interested in partnering with me. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so there is, so I, I could have, I could have gone into that and maybe I could do that in a, in a future talk if there was a lot of interest, but you've got to be careful because modern dyes also fluoresce. So you've got to use it for textiles, you know, are pre-modern dyes or else things get a bit off the rails, if you will. So there's a whole other area we can look at. Um, yeah. Okay. And, oh, I start, and to tie it into the, sorry, to tie it back to the SCA, um, the person who did that for me at the, Museum, she's a laurel in the SCA and they have Viking, no, um, Finnish age textiles that are red. And she wants to use that same process to see if they use the same red because they have the same mushrooms there. So it all comes back to the SCA one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> we had somebody else um, who was asking uh, if you had, uh, if you had talked about seaweed, <laughs> have you had, have you dabbled in seaweed as well as to the no, land? Yeah. Um, the only book, there's a book up, there was a, a lady, I think in the fifties and sixties who lived in Alaska. And so there's a book, um, I don't have it in front of me. She died with, with seaweeds. And so she covers seaweeds, but again, they're going to be seas of the Bering and Chukchi Sea. They're not mm -hmm. the seaweeds we have off here. So she has done some of that work. As far as I know, no one's really using seaweed off of the coast here. That's sort of publishing it or blogging about it. Um, that's not to say that you can't. And I've had the question um, from a couple of elders here, if anyone is dying with sea urchins. And the answer is, I don't know of anyone doing sea urchins, but I kind of want to try sea urchin dying now. So that might be a thing to try out. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm also, I dabble in mushrooms. And when I go and I hunt mushrooms, I know very precisely what I am picking. <laughs> before it ever approaches my mouth or one of my things. Yeah, I kind of think that there's four things you should know. You should know what your mushroom looks like. Like what are its characteristics versus other mushrooms? You yeah. should know what it grows on. You should know what it smells like. And you should know what ones that look like it, but are poisonous are. Yes. And if you've got those four things happening, go for it. And there's, there's good things. And I don't, I don't want to scare people. There's like right yes. now it's ch chanterelle season. And if you harvest chanterelles and dry saute them and add a little butter and garlic you're just I mean there's just super tasty right. great with um scrambled eggs there's lots of good stuff just yeah yeah I I've also from more experienced mushroom hunters I've heard the thing that you want to do first is figure out the ones that are deadly poisonous and learn the ones that look like it yeah you know because you're probably better off until you're an expert mushroom hunter avoiding the ones that even remotely and the other thing to keep in mind is that different cultures have different definitions of what's an edible mushroom. So for example, a lot of Eastern European cultures collect a lot of mushrooms and there mm -hmm. might be some intestinal distress and it's fine. Like they, so if someone's like, yeah, it's fine to eat, like, like ask some questions. because It, it was tasty enough. There's things care. that might be acceptable to them that might not be acceptable to you if you catch me. Yeah. If I remember right, uh, what the rain brings, the uh, mushroom field guide, mm -hmm. it does go over uh, whether or not it's deadly, whether or not it'll cause gastrointestinal distress, or whether or not it's edible. So, yeah. I've got a, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. um, somebody at one point on, I think on like the mushroom lichen uh, Facebook group said that like the ones that are white and gilled don't really do much as far as dyes. So just pretty much ignore them. Do you know that, like, have you found any that do stuff or? White gills. Um, 
not for dyeing, um, but some things that are white and boring will give you bright colors. For example, okay. white coral, much like um, Romaria. Weirdly enough, the colored Romaria, which comes in like pinks and different colors, doesn't do anything, but the really boring white and beigey one will give you purple. Yeah, but they're, um, not, they're not guild though, so. No, no, like, no, but I'm just, I'm just kind of giving yeah. you an example. I so can't it was, think it was of like, the top of my head of a single, but that's the weird thing. It might be that if that assumption means people aren't trying. Because I kind of ignore, of I, I ignore them anyway, which means that you're, you know, ignoring all the poisonous agaricus and stuff. Oh, and totally, yeah. Like, I look and, for the weird ones, like yeah. the, the dyer's polypore, so. God, yeah, I, I, I don't, there's nothing with white gills that I pick for color. I love me some Dyer's polypore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's been a good year for them too. Oh, and then another question is, um, I have yet to find any reference that is from moss that doesn't end up being a lichen or a club moss. Um, but I'd be interested to know if the if the Coast Salish have any mosses they've used that are actual mosses. Cause I don't know. That's a little like I, I soapbox, also... soapbox pet peeve I sometimes get on. I, I also, to be honest with you, I work closely with Coast Salish weavers and dyers, and I don't really have a lot of, I don't have permission to talk about that side of things. That's I'm fair. trying to, to keep it really general. Um, in terms of the club moss, there, we, we know that the Vikings use club moss as a source of aluminum. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of club moss here. And we have the old blankets have tested positive for aluminum. Is that where the aluminum comes from? I don't know. But I would be I would be interested in, in looking at that from an analysis perspective. We don't. No one has looked at. We have um, the only thing they've looked at with the blankets is uh, presence of metals, and that's all that we have. So we know that they test positive for aluminum and iron and surprisingly tin, though we don't know why or how tin is is possible. But it is. It, they're there. We know it. So I don't. In terms of, of, of moss uses and traditional uses of mosses and stuff, I don't, um, that's not something that I would comment on. Okay. It's just every once in a while, like somebody mentions it and then I'm like, always, then there's a picture, but it's always a lichen. Yeah, so fair enough. It's been yeah. like my, my little soapbox. <laughs> totally fair. I've got a question about the uh, Romaria. Yeah. You said that you can't uh, stir it, dry it, et cetera. Can mm -hmm. you? process it and is the dye stable after it's processed you can't i mean pro you can't process it like uh, you just can, can you so put we, it we, in a dye pot and then uh say will the dye be stable and oh i see sorry um yeah it's a, it's a stable dye i mean relatively speaking it's a stable dye it's okay, much cool. more stable than tapanella so if you're dying if you if you're going in the woods and there's romaria out so Coral mushrooms are really hard to identify down to species, but Romaria is the really beefy one. Like it's like substantial coral. Um, if you get that and it's a, like a white, very pale beige, that's the right one. You don't want colored tips or anything like that. And you at home, you want to have um, pre-mordant iron. It needs to be pre-mordant with iron. So you, and then you can simmer that in the pot. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you, <clears throat> I haven't got a lot of purples. I've gotten a lot of browns and I'm working on it because I've seen photos of people using it and gotten a lot of purples. Um, I, I talked to uh, Alyssa Allens. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And she thinks that I'm not, I haven't collected quite enough Romaria because I've tried to be really conservative with what I collect, but she suggested that I try um, a, a higher quantity of Romaria and if that makes the difference to get into the purples. Okay, because uh, it's coming up all over in Seabeck right now. It, okay. It just just starting up, I could collect a good bunch of it, but um, I'm drying everything, and if I can, if it doesn't dry, it's kind of pointless. Unless it won't. I can... Yeah, it's 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 the as far as I know, it's the it's the exception to the rule. You can't dry it or freeze it; it won't work. But so if I could put it in boiling water, uh, extract the dye, and then just uh, uh, keep that, would that work? I don't know. That's a good question for Alyssa. Right, I'll do that. Sorry, sorry. Sure. Also, sometimes even if you collect it fresh, it doesn't do anything. Like maybe it's dried out in the woods, you know, before you pick mm -hmm. it too much or something. It's just so so variable. And I was also reading that for some of the Romeria, you need to actually have a mic have it under the microscope to really get down to the taxonomy. So I could easily have not quite the right one. Mushrooms so it could, it could be that, that you know more work is needed but i'm i'm it's one of those things i'm i've got it going and i'm gonna get my purple <laughs> trying 
Yeah, I want to uh, give you a big thank you because uh, last year I started walking in the woods looking for a fungus, uh, and I've been a biologist all my life and never focused on fungus. No. We live in the most incredible place for fungus. It's true. It's amazing. It's totally, like I've, I'm have i much into, into birding, and I've been birding for most of my life, and I have my life list, and I, I look out, it's something, you know, rare pops up, and the rare bird alert, I'm out. But I never really looked at mushrooms. And so like in British Columbia, we have 3,500 species and and we're being, you know, there's probably more like 7,000. We just don't know it. And there's so much diversity. People around the world who love mushrooms are, are jealous we get to live here because the mushrooms are so good and we get to go out all year. Other places, other especially parts of Canada um, are under snow. The mushrooms are done and we get to, we get to, you know, go into January and, and still do mushrooms. So we're very lucky. I totally agree with you. It's, it's completely changed how I walk through the woods. I'm just super excited to meet you because apparently all of our mutual friends thought we already knew each other. <laughs> it sounds good. Because <laughs> yeah, they're sure. like, oh, you don't know her? You're going to have to have geek out times. Well, yeah, yes, totally. Um, you talk a lot about using alum or like iron as a mordant, mm -hmm. but are there like any other that maybe aren't like um, medieval or natural but like something more modern and easier accessed okay it depends what you're going going for some some things you don't need a mordant for at all you don't need metal at all some of these lichens and some of the mushrooms um for example a tapanella is one that's out right now that gives you a purple you can dry it um you you don't want anything you just want pure wool you don't want it processed in any way so if you're wanting to avoid metals I would get much more into the lichen dyeing. Lichens don't need a lot of mordants. You can see so that kind of, you can avoid it all together if you want to. But if you're, if you want kind of the full gambit of colors available to you, you probably will need to look at mordants. Um, there's a few different metals you can use. There's about sort of five or six, but some of them are quite toxic. Like chrome is quite toxic. And so I wouldn't recommend, a lot of shops won't sell it. I think you can still buy it, but I wouldn't recommend working with it. Whereas if you work with, alum which is what has the aluminum it's actually food safe it's what you use to pickle cucumbers so you can actually get alum in the supermarket so that's a that's a really good one and um generally stuff that's uh, you've pre-mordant with alum um you'll get the color that's in the pot so whatever color the dye that is that's the color you'll get on your fiber whereas if you use iron it goes much much darker if you use copper it goes kind of much more green so you can kind of the metal that you use kind of dials in different colors depending on what you want. I'm not sure if that answers your question, though. Oh, no, that completely answers my question. Oh, Thank okay, you. good. Um, then I actually have another question. Okay, so, go for it. For a boiling method, um, how much would keeping the heat regulated um, mess with the color outcome? That's a great or question. That's a great question. Um, and I'll answer from an like a, a historical perspective. A, a lot of new research into historical textile dyeing is moving away from heat and going more with cold dyeing. So a lot of the research coming out is saying, and um, there's a Laurel in the SCA named, uh, she's in my friends list, Mervy. Um, and then that, so she's with the Finnish National Museum. So she's just doing coal dyeing and it's cr incredible the colors that she's getting. So that's one thing is that from, a hit, so from an SCA perspective, it might be because heat was hard to get, like you had to process that wood and then whatever you were dyeing with, you couldn't use it for anything else. Like it, it, it's inhibitive to some, some of these cultures, right? For some things are more um, sensitive to temperatures than others. So especially when you get into the reds and purples, if you boil that, usually if you get above sort of 90 degrees Celsius, whatever that is in Fahrenheit, it'll start denaturing. So matter is, a, you can get matter um, and it gets red, but if you boil that, you will get brown. And if you do the yellows, often they'll just go into a beigey color. So when I'm doing dyeing, <clears throat> I usually keep it around seven, 70 to 80 degrees Celsius, whatever that is in Fahrenheit. And just enough, you kind of want it simmering. So you can have kind of a couple bubbles you can kind of have it where there's motion, but you don't want it to boil. And so I kind of get it there and I give it an hour and then I add my fiber and another hour. Um, another thing you can do with lichens that you can't do with mushrooms is stack the dye. 
which means that if you have lichens going in your fiber, heat for an hour, heat for another, like heat for an hour, cool, heat for an hour. If you keep doing that, you're gonna darken the colors. Whereas mushrooms, you kind of, after an hour, that's the color you're gonna get. It doesn't really darken. Um, you can kind of leave fibers overnight and I tend to leave my fibers in overnight, but that's kind of what you're gonna get. So play around with it. A good rule of thumb is don't let it boil. And a big, the only exception really that I know is cochineal, which is the, that's the scale insect from um, Southeastern US. Um, it's such a good, great concentrated dyer. You can boil the crap out of that and it'll just, it's just impervative, impervious to, set, to temperature really. But then you get in trouble with your fiber, your fiber will start felting out too, so. I actually experimented with cochineal at one point um, and that that one was a lot of fun when it comes out to color mm -hmm. output. I really like that one. A fun thing to do with kosher needle too, it, it varies wildly by, by pH. So if you have a few skeins in, you can pull one out, add some, add some you know, shift, shift the pH, you can add some ammonia or some vinegar and you'll get a completely different color and you can kind of pull things out and get a huge range from the same pot. There's some, some fun things you can do with kosher needle for sure. Uh, I have a quick question for you. Other mm -hmm. than rainbow beneath your, my feet. Yeah. Was, um, do you have other mushroom and lichen dyeing books that you right. like to use? There is, a, there is another one, but again, it's older. Her last name is Rice. I can't, Miriam Rice, I think. She's a guide. It's okay. She was sort of the original. She's sort of the, the mother of modern mushroom dyeing in the Pacific Northwest. Alyssa Allen is, is writing a book that'll be out hopefully at some point soon. There's a Swedish book, and unfortunately, it's in, it's in Swedish, but it lays things out beautifully, and they have, they have the same species there. And so I've ordered it, and it's kind of what a lot of people are using, because you it, the photos are good enough that you don't need to understand the Swedish to use it. If you have so, a smartphone, your uh, phone will translate it. So there you go. Um, that's a, I, can, I, can, um, I can pass on the name of that. But that's kind of the book. That's kind of what Alyssa Allen's has recommended people use. And so I think Uncle will probably sort of eek on by until Alyssa's, Alyssa's book is ready. Okay, well, I know that you have small children that <laughs> probably need to go to bed soon. I know that we're <clears throat> going to go hassle ours in a minute still. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, so if... um. If there are any other uh, questions, what I'll what I'll say at this point, so so you can go put the small ones to bed. Um, if there are questions, if people want to direct them to us, we can contact you. Um, and also, uh, oh, we're, we're going to be in contact. <laughs> we'll be sounds sending good. you pictures and say, but what about this? <laughs> yeah, no, sounds good. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll have uh, information posted in the YouTube notes and. Um, this has been this has been a really fabulous class. Thank you so much for, for oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I, it would be easy to be like, no, no, continue for another four hours. I have more questions. Um, <laughs> but, um yeah. I maybe no, want good. spring time long for a class for, oh, yeah. for spring day. <laughs> I would love to. I would love to come down when that was when we were when that's possible. Um, one thing I have here, if you if you're interested, it might not be interested. Um. There's a video, they did like a five minute documentary of the mushroom dying. So if anyone wants a little video, it's only five minutes. I'll post it here in the, so there's a little YouTube that they did at the museum, local museum um, on mushroom dying and stuff. So there you go. I'll, I'll link that in the uh, uh, YouTube description too. Yeah, Perfect. so I saw somebody ask, so these go up under the barony of Terra Pomeria. We have we have our own channel. So <laughs> okay. yeah, the videos will go up there. Um, but yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I have been excited about the possibility of us getting to have this class since you told me about your interview. <laughs> so. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much for having me on. I was really, it's, it's really fun. Yeah, marvelous. Well, we look forward to, to meeting you in person someday. And uh, <laughs> yes, I, I, I believe I should close with a quote from a calendar that one of my coworkers gave me, which was, there are old mushroom hunters and there are bold mushroom hunters, <laughs> but there are no old, bold mushroom hunters. I love it. It's true. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you later.